Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hey everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Well, it's good to be with everyone live and in person at this Inform event at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Tony Shu. I'm the co-founder and CEO of DoorDash. And I'm actually really excited to be putting Guy in an interviewee seat, you know, for once as we discuss his awesome book, How I Built This, um, you know, covering the many lessons that he's learned and, and stories that he's, you know, shared about hundreds of entrepreneurs uh, who've done amazing things in this world, and you know, I couldn't be m more thrilled. Um, you know, as, as um, the speakers were saying earlier, please, this is gonna be an interactive event, so as, as you're thinking about questions for Guy, um, you know, prepare them. There are some note cards for you as you're um, thinking about those topics throughout the night, and then for those on, you know, watching this online, please also use the text chat feature in YouTube. Uh, we will make sure and do our best to you know, prescribe those questions and also ask them towards the end as well. Um, well, with that, maybe we should just kick it off. You know, Guy, you've done a lot of different things in your career, and I actually thought, you know, for the benefit of those online and those here in the room, maybe we start talking about you. I, I know you're, you're so used to covering other people, but why entrepreneurship? Why, yeah. you know, t tell the stories of these founders and entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, I was just thinking as you were introducing me that we, of course, we've seen each other since our interview um, uh, on the show. I think it was three years ago, four years ago. I can't remember when you were on. Just about a mile from here where we did the interview face-to-face -face and we sat in a very small room for three and a half hours, which is something that a lot of people don't know, which is my interviews are very long, three and a half, <laughs> four hours, um, and we edit them down. But um, thank you. So thank you for, for turning the tables. Um, why, why entrepreneurs? You know, it's, it's interesting. I did not um, ever want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, my dad and mom were. They uh, came to the United States in 1970 and uh, had their children here, and they had a small business. My dad had a jewelry shop his entire career. Um, I mean, he was an engineer for some time, and then um, in his early 40s, he decided to start his own business. It was a big risk, right? It was a huge mm. leap to leave his career as an engineer um, working in the aerospace industry in Southern California to start a jewelry store, um, but he did with my mom, and they really grinded. It was a lot of work. I remember when I was a kid in West Covina, um, watching them go through these, um, you know, these dot matrix printouts of of leads, cold calling people um, about their their jewelry. They sold pearls, and eventually got a little store in downtown LA. Um, in an office building, and that was how they sustained an, a family of four children and built a, a, a career. You know, they were never, my dad's business was never huge, but he had five or six employees at a certain time, and, um, and, and, and it was what he did, but it was stressful. I remember there were years when the economy wasn't great and people weren't buying pearls, and, you know, and my dad is now 80, and he is, you know, he was, I didn't know this at the time, but I only discovered later was just incredibly well respected in mm -hmm. the industry. Um, to this day, people who still work in it know my dad and um, just talk about him as such an honest broker and a good person and a mentor and things I didn't know as a kid. What I saw was the struggle and the worry and the anxiety of starting a business. And I think I grew up at a time, you know, I grew up in in the 80s and, and early 90s when I think a lot of kids were pushed to go into law or medicine or you know sort of stable careers. I think even in a sense maybe you were too a little bit because you're of your parents, their sure. immigrant story. And you know my parents wanted a stable, secure life for their children and so that's what I thought I would do, maybe go into law or a career that, you know, where I'd get a job. And that that was really what I, what I did. I mean, I went into yeah. journalism and hmm. and pursued this. In, uh, you know, I had this incredibly um, fortunate career because early in my in my career, I was given opportunities to report from overseas. I I, I joined National National Public Radio when I was 22, 
And at 25, I became the Berlin bureau chief. So I, was this, I had this like very fortunate, lucky break at an early age in my, in my life where I, I spent seven years overseas covering Eastern Europe and then eventually the Iraq war and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And so I had this really rich series of experiences um, that, that I wanted to do, that I wanted to pursue. Um, but over time, you know, um, I, I really began to think about the stories we were telling as reporters. And one of the things that I, I realized was that I went into the profession to, um, I think I went into the profession of journalism to, and I think a lot of reporters and journalists do this, because I, I thought it was a bridge. It was a way to mm. explain how people live to other people. So mm. I ended up covering a lot of conflicts, Pakistan, India, in Kashmir, mm. Sunni, Shia, and Iraq, um, you know, the, the warring factions of Afghanistan. I covered Israel, Palestine. And my, uh, in my mind, I thought, if only I could explain how this group of people lives and then explain how this group of people lives, then these groups will understand each other. And actually, the, you know, I could make some kind of abstract contribution to, to bettering the world. What I, what I, I think over time, what I, mm. what I realized was that that wasn't the impact I felt that I was having. Mm. And so about 12 years ago, um, I left the world of news about 13 years ago, I left the world of news and then eventually left NPR entirely. Um, and decided to embark on my own kind of midlife crisis uh, like my dad had, mm -hmm. start, started my own businesses, production companies. And what I, what I, what I wanted, to, what I realized, and this, this really ha happened by chance, um, I, was, I basically became burned out. There was a, I, I mm. went from NPR to CNN, and I, I failed miserably at CNN. I was a terrible television reporter. I was not made for television. And... I, you know, er, my early 30s, I was, I had been overseas for many, many years and really worked hard chasing something that I, I wasn't sure what it, what it was that I was chasing, you know, recognition or achievement. I don't know what it was. Um, mm. But in my early 30s, I had an opportunity to take a year out and do a, a fellowship, a journalism fellowship. It was the same year my first son was born. And I took a class that year at Harvard Business School. I'd never taken a business school class in my life. I didn't know anything about business. I was a journalist. I, I knew how to land in, in Diyarbakir in eastern Turkey or in Kabul and find a, a translator quickly and get a hotel and get money and start reporting. I could be on the air that night. So from that perspective, I was resourceful, but I didn't know how to start a business. I didn't mm. know anything about business. I took a class at Harvard Business School, and I was stunned that in that class, the way they teach business school was through the case study method. I knew nothing about it, okay? Mm -hmm. This was in like 2008. And I thought to myself, so these people are paying $120,000 a year to hear stories, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I thought to myself, this is, this is kind of nuts because this is what I do for a living. Mm. And it planted mm. a seed in my mind, which is, could I do a version of that? Could I tell these stories in, a, in an even richer way? in a deeper way and make it free, yeah. make it accessible to everybody. Could I, and, 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 and the reason why those stories just spoke to me was because it just never occurred to me until I took that class mm. that business stories are like hero's journeys. Mm -hmm. They have every, they have, you know, you can find all those moments on the hero's journey arc, the Joseph Campbell arc in a business story. There's a hero. Hero has a crazy idea. Everybody tells Hero, your idea is crazy. Hero must leave the village to pursue the idea. <laughs> Hero finds a mentor. Mentor dies. Hero ends up s battling a dragon, a venture capitalist, whatever they are. Right? <laughs> um, and eventually, over time, the hero overcomes all of these challenges and triumphs. It's Star Wars. It's Harry Potter. It's Odysseus. It's Noah. And I started to see elements of that in, in, in business stories. It's, mm. It has all of the drama of the human experience. Mm. The, the, the lying on the bathroom floor, crying in a fetal position, the, the, the incredible triumphs and joys. I mean, you've been through it yourself, went through it during the pandemic. It comes and goes. I mean, it's, it, and so 
in those stories, I realize that, you know, in those, in those examples of founders, I realize that you can tell incredible narrative, cinematic visual narrative, mm. and you can actually help people understand how they might do something like that themselves. So that's how it began. I love it. Democratizing HBS is what I wrote down <laughs> as. Exactly. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, the, the, the way that I, I read the book, it, it was that it was broken into kind of three sections, right? On trying to uncover all facets of founding a business and d discussing the hero's journey. The first section is getting the call to actually, you know, make the idea a thing. And, and you know, I'm kind of curious, what have you learned about, you know, new ideas or how people discover their ideas? I mean, you've covered hundreds of stories. I'm sure you've spoken to thousands of people. Obviously, you have your dad as well as your own journey. What have you learned about how to source these ideas, the opening? You know, it's obviously the, the, the journey is different for every single entrepreneur, but yeah. the, the, the main similarity is a person identifies a problem that they think they can solve. And it's something that is not just a problem that they have, but a problem that they believe lots of other people do. So for example, you're a student. Lots of students want an In-N-Out burger you know that you can actually drive to In-N-Out Burger and deliver the burgers to them. And maybe you can create an app and maybe they'll use that app to, and then In-N-Out will find out and tell you to stop doing it. That's your story, by that's the right. way. <laughs> um, uh, that's, just, that's, that's how you began, right? And so it's, you, you, you see that there's a problem and that there's a need to solve that problem. And it could be anything from, you know, Lisa Price of Carol's Daughter, who didn't feel like there were moisturizers and lotions hmm. um, for, for black women that, that spoke to her and that filled a need that she had and that she knew that there were lots of women like her that she knew in Brooklyn who might have the same problem um, and the same uh, you know, frustrations. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's virtually every founder that I've interviewed. It's, hmm. it's Howard Schultz who, who didn't believe that you could get outstanding coffee, like the kind of coffee he had in Milan in the United States, easily accessible, that was available everywhere, o outstanding coffee. And so you identify a problem and you figure out how to execute it better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's the basic beginnings of any business that's on how I, that's on how I built this. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, in the ideas you mentioned, whether it's, you know, the, the idea for delivering lunch and dinner or starting a new type of coffee shop or building new lotions. I mean, these don't sound like original ideas. No. And right. I, mean, I mean, I guess, it, it, you know, especially for folks thinking about starting a business, I mean, what can you tell us about what you've learned in speaking with hundreds of people? You know, what is the bar for the goodness of this idea? Does it really have to be that original or what have you learned about that? I've been thinking about this so much lately because, you know, when, when you have a business idea, not just a business idea, but a product idea, or say you work in a company and you have an, an idea for doing things in a different way. And I'm sure all of you have experienced a version of this, which is you tell somebody or, or, or a group of people about your idea, your business, your product, or your innovative you know, work, workplace change. And, and inevitably, somebody will say to you, well, how is that different from what we're doing? Or how is that different from what's out there? Or how is that new, right? And that's a, that's a very natural question to ask because yeah. we humans, we think that for something to, be, to have value, it should be new or different. Mm -hmm. And that actually to have appeal, it should be new or different. But in actual fact, very few things are new or different, right? I mean, if you think about things that are really new or different, like, I don't know, Google Glass or Quibi or mm. blue ketchup from Heinz, they all fail, okay? Mm. Now, it's not to say they're bad ideas, it's just that a really, really new original idea doesn't always actually mm. find an audience. Many of the most celebrated companies in the world, Google and Facebook, for example, were founded, I mean, the technology existed. What they did was they executed better. And, I, and the reason why this is a top of mind is because if I look at, out of the almost 550 interviews we've had on how I built this, probably 90% of those companies 
did not create something entirely new, which I think is very mm. hard to do, right? M virtually all of them improved on an mm. existing technology, executed better. And one of, the, one of my favorite examples of this is a chicken restaurant called Raising Cane's. Okay, Raising Cane's, I don't think they have, they don't have, I think the closest ones in like Stockton or Sacramento. It's, it's a restaurant, a fast food restaurant that is the second most profitable fast food restaurant in terms of sales per unit. Number one is Chick-fil-A chicken restaurant. Number two is Raising Cane's. Uh, In-N-Out Burger is like number four, okay? This is not total revenue because McDonald's is obviously number one, but, but if you just account for how many restaurants they have and how much revenue each restaurant does, Raising Cane's number two. It started in 1996 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This is a restaurant started by a guy named Todd Graves who literally went to an Alaskan salmon fishing boat for a summer and an oil refinery in LA in the spring before that to basically get as much money as he could to, to qualify for an SBA loan in order to start his first restaurant in Baton Rouge. He made $50,000 in a seven month period in the world's most dangerous jobs. And he took that money and he founded a chicken finger restaurant in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, this is 1996. His menu is chicken fingers, Texas toast, coleslaw, crinkle cut fries. That's it. That's the whole menu, okay? Now, in 1996, people are saying to him, you're nuts, you're in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You gotta have a Cajun flavored chicken finger. No. You gotta sell salads, it's healthy. People want, listen, if people want salads, they can go to another restaurant. I do chicken fingers, Texas toast, coleslaw, and crinkle cut fries. And the thing is, is that if you walk into a restaurant with those four things in the menu, Basically, what they're saying to you is, hey, uh, guy, we make this better than anybody else on planet Earth mm. because that's all we sell. You can't lean on the Frosties or the burgers or the tacos or anything else. Like, if we fail in these four things, our restaurant collapses. And so he didn't invent chicken fingers. Yeah. Chick-fil-A was out there. Okay. He just came up with a concept and executed so well. Today, the menu hasn't changed. They have 600 restaurants, and it's an incredible story. And, and it's those kinds of stories that I think really tell you so much about how businesses actually operate. Yeah. Well, why do you think these, why do you think they execute so much better? I mean, to your point, I mean, there's nothing special about a chicken finger or original, but somehow, you know, number two sales per unit profitability. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, I mean it's something, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago or months ago when we saw each other last about Chick-fil-A. You know, Chick-fil-A, obviously, there people have different opinions about Chick-fil-A because, uh, but think about Chick-fil-A. I mean, it is a company that is open f six days a week. They are closed on Sunday, and it is the most profitable fast food chain in the United States. Mm. Okay, they're, they're, they're closed one day of the week, so every other chain has the advantage of seven days, mm. and they're open six days. Plus, they're, I think they have some of the highest retention rates, employee retention rates in the country. They have a, a very clear way for employees to rise up the ranks, same with In-N-Out Burger. So if you wanna be a manager or you wanna work in corporate and you apply and day one you say, hey, I really wanna work in management one day, they'll put you on a path yeah. to do that. And Raising Cane, some of these companies that are successful, uh, they do that. Mm. They, I mean, you know this, mm. they focus on their people and they now it's very fashionable to say okay my employees are number one my customers are two my investors are three it used to be right investors one and customers two but now it's it's becoming normal and it as it should have been all along for companies to put their employees at the top i think the companies that execute well have been doing it longer they un they've mm. understood that longer um and i you know i've seen that across the board. I've seen that across the board in companies that especially consumer facing products and brands that, you know, continue to grow. You know, one of the things that you talk about in your book is this, you know, concept between what's dangerous versus what's scary. And, you know, I heard it a little bit in your own career in which it sounds like, you know, minus the burnout part, maybe you could have had future careers as a journalist yep. and as a reporter. Yep yet you chose to take that midlife crisis and do something about it. Um, your father did something similar. Obviously, hundreds of people that you've you know, spoken to have done that in your book. 
Can you maybe tell more, especially for those in the audience considering starting a company, maybe they have the idea to do something better than what was previously existed. How do you choose what's dangerous versus what's scary for your career? Yeah, and th this is a concept that I borrowed from Jim Cook, who is the founder hmm. of uh, Boston Beer Company. Um, and, and that's where I first heard, heard of the concept when he came to, to do an interview with me five years ago. And I should preface it by saying, Starting a business isn't, to me, the apex of, of, of you know, a fulfilling career. You can actually be transformational within a company, right? You can actually do, I mean, Johnny Ive worked at Apple. Like, I mean, there are people who have transformed companies within those companies and have been internal entrepreneurs. You probably have them at DoorDash. I, I think that, but I think this concept of dangerous versus scary has been really helpful for me as a framework, right? Mm. Because there are lots of things that we do that are really scary. Getting up on stage in front of people is scary. I've been doing it for 12 years and I still get nervous every time. You know, I, I just did a, a live show in Chicago for our, I do a children's podcast called Wow in the World and I'm a character. I, I play a character, I'm on stage, I sing, I dance. I know, it's weird. <laughs> you can't imagine, right? Um, and we're in front of 5,000 people at the Chicago Theater and my heart is pounding even to this day and I've been doing this for a long time. So we do things that are scary, but, but scary is okay. Scary is important. It's mm. the things that are dangerous that are different. And mm. so, so the story comes from Jim Cook, which is he, was, he had a really, really great career at Boston Consulting Group. Mm -hmm. he, had a, he had family, he had two kids, and he was married, and he was on track to become partner, but he, he just didn't feel fulfilled. He just didn't feel it. And, you know, and not everyone goes through this, but there are some people who are very successful, lawyers or f in finance, and, and, and there's a point where they just feel like, I've got to do something on my own. But you get trapped by the golden handcuffs, right? Because it's stable and you're in the career, and it's the responsible thing to do is just keep doing it. But he, he, he thought about his life, and he thought, if I don't try this, if I don't try to create my own business. And he really wanted to make beer, by the way, okay? <laughs> this is in the early 80s when American beer was a joke. I mean, yeah. I mean American beer was, there, there, there's a famous Monty Python sketch, um, you might remember, where they're, they're talking about piss, beer, and urine, right? Um, so the idea that you could create an American beer that was not only great, but that would be celebrated around the world, and that would kickstart a craft beer revolution in the United States, Nobody thought that in 1984, when, but Jim Cook really wanted to do this. And so he left his job at Boston Consulting mm. Group because he, he thought to himself, if I don't do this, it's dangerous. Because if I stay here and I wake up and I'm 70 years old and I didn't do it, I'm gonna regret not having done it. Now, I don't wanna regret, I don't wanna have regret. That's dangerous. Mm. Is it scary to take the leap and to try this? It is. He also knew and this is something that's really important, and I think you can speak to this too, Tony. He also knew that there was a fallback. Doing something risky doesn't mean you jump out of an airplane without a parachute. And actually, I think here in the Bay Area, there's been this myth perpetuated. I don't necessarily think intentionally. I think it's come, it's been mythologized in the media and of these brash entrepreneurs, you know, and, and we can see these, these Apple TV shows now and <laughs> about, about what happened. But these brash entrepreneurs who jump out of the airplane without a parachute and, and they just go for it and they're risk takers. And the reality is, at least in the f more than 500 interviews I've done, they're like, I can count on one hand, entrepreneurs who fit that bill. Mark Cuban is one of them. He's just, a, he's just totally, he's like, go for it. It's, you know, I'm gonna just, take this risk and if I crash and burn and lose everything, well, I, I do. But most of them don't do that. Most of them mitigate their risks. You know, Jim Cook, for example, he didn't leave Boston Consulting Group one day. He spent like nine months researching the beer industry in the US, trying to find bottlers, trying to craft a recipe that he made in his own kitchen, okay, to come up with a really good beer. He talked to friends, many of whom told him he was crazy, but you know, he really looked at the, he, he did really careful market research to determine whether he could actually do this. And when he left Boston Consulting Group, he also knew that if this venture totally failed, he could probably find work as a consultant again. Um, and that's the important thing, which is that 
great entrepreneurs are also, they're risk takers, it's a big risk to do that, but they mitigate those risks. One of the things as you know, these ideas become projects and the projects actually get incorporated and kind of turn into companies is, you know, you actually have to build a business, right? And this is kind of like the second part of, you know, your book as you kind of start, you've made the call now as the entrepreneur to actually go and do this. Yeah. And now you got to turn it into a business. And actually this question's from the audience, um, which is you talk a, a, about, you know, having a plan to actually turn the idea into something profitable. Um, can you maybe say more about what some of the best entrepreneurs have done during this kind of middle phase to actually turn the idea into something concrete and turn it from a project into a business? You know, it's interesting because I think that we have an instinct, um, especially when we're building. And, mm. and, and you probably went through versions of this, and I've been through versions of this with the shows I've created and, and with, with the businesses that I've started, which is um, the instinct is to focus on what we're not doing right, hmm. thinking that that is actually going to help us improve. And so we often become very self-critical hmm. of our processes. We often look at other competitors and, and, and we try to figure out how to differentiate what we're doing in the marketplace. And I think that successful companies, whether they do this intentionally or not, um, are able to kind of avoid that, certainly in the early stages, and really focus on trying things out and taking yeah. and taking good risks, right? I mean, and really kind of pursuing something even if it doesn't seem like it's working right away. And, and, and of course, at a certain point, knowing when to make a pivot. I mean, DoorDash did not take off right away. Mm -hmm. DoorDash was not immediately successful. It took a, a lot of time before it started to get adopted. And it was really adopted here in the Bay Area at the beginning and tech areas, but it wasn't a mainstream product mm -hmm. for a long time. And there were plenty of people who could have said, I don't know if this is gonna go anywhere. And there may have been people who did say that. Plenty. Or plenty, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, or people who said, you know, the big guys are just gonna swallow you up, right? right? Now you're the big guy. Um, but I, I think that's the, that's, the, that's the key. It's like having, having the sort of the, 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 the stamina and the ability mm. to push forward even when there are doubters, but also to have, you know, a clear, the, the sort of the clear headedness to understand when it's time to, 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 to change course. We just did, um, we just did an episode on discord on Jason mm. Citron discord, who started the business here. He moved to Berkeley. It's a great, amazing story of how he built this company. And, you know, his goal was to build a video game company. He's a video. He loves video games. Yep. He's a gamer. He wanted to make lots of massive multiplayer online games and that really was the plan but discord really was the thing that took off and it was the thing that that people wanted mm. um and so that was where they focused their energy on i mean even his first business which which was a you know he he, he created a, a a game an app yeah. um what really worked and that didn't work but what really worked was when he built a, a social network platform that enabled people to communicate mm. playing these games and so that's where they ended, ended up focusing their attention on so part of it is is you know pushing forward but part of it's also recognizing mm. when it's time to try something different it's hard to know but it's 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 one of those kind of you know it's it's one of those approaches that i think just um, that almost kind of reveals itself to you mm. when the time is right. And what have you learned in speaking with, you know, these founders and entrepreneurs in some of these crucible moments, right? Where catastrophe certainly is looming right, you know, <laughs> in front of your eyes. Sometimes maybe you got to make the pivot. You know, the other story that comes to mind that I know you tell in, in, in listening to your interviews is, is Slack. You know, Slack also wanting to build a game actually yep. and very similarly like discord finds out that this messaging platform underneath is actually yes. the thing that people want versus the game itself um i guess like what do the founders do wh or what have you found inspiration in maybe studying when they meet those crucible moments which inevitably hit everyone yeah. what is your advice maybe to folks in the audience that may be going through that now 
Yeah, I mean, um, invariably, and, and you know, How I Built This is not a show about success. I know, of course, it's like a romantic mm -hmm. comedy. You always know that at the end, they're either going to fall in love or they're not going to fall in love, but they're friends. And my, actually, my favorite romantic comedy is Mrs. Doubtfire <laughs> that takes place here in San Francisco because it's a great ending, but they don't get back together. Yeah. Sorry if I ruined it for you. <laughs> Sorry, it's a, it's a great, but you know, you know the basic arc of a, of a rom-com. Yeah. And so sometimes people will say, oh, why don't you focus on companies that failed miserably mm -hmm. on how I built this? And what I say is, because that's not what the show is. There are great shows that do that. But what we're doing is we're not focusing on the success or the money or the wealth. We're focusing on those crucible moments and, and the crises because I want people to understand that building a successful business, any business, is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard, and I think a lot of us, we fetishize founders, and we say, look at these heroes. You know, we talk about Elon Musk, or you know, or Sergey and Larry, or Tony, and, and I don't want people to think of founders as superheroes. I want them to think of people who are like us, and that we can actually do a version of that if we think about it in the right way. One of the, one of the, 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 the most important things that I, I look for when I look to to interview a founder is failure, is mm. set, our setbacks, because that is what we can learn from. That's where we learn the most. We learn from people's failures, not from their successes. Having somebody come on and say, and then we did this, and then we knocked it out of the park there, and then there, and then we were done. It's, <laughs> it's not an interesting story. It's not useful for us. We need to hear from founders about the moments when they were on the bathroom floor crying and how they overcame it. And you know, we had an, an episode a couple months ago um, I interviewed John Hendrickson, John Hendricks, who is the founder of Discovery, the Discovery Network. And it is an unbelievable story. I mean, this guy was, he, 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 in the 80s, when cable was just starting, he had no experience, he had no connections, he was never done television in his life, but he really was obsessed with documentaries. Hmm. And he wanted to create a cable channel that would just air documentaries. And the first few years, it was just, they were basically buying up old BBC documentaries and licensing them. It was before people really licensed media. So the BBC was like, sure, extra cash. And they would license it to him for, for peanuts. But the satellite transmission fees were so high. I mean, they were paying mm. like $400,000 a week to reach, you know, I don't know, 10,000 homes in America. And that company, like, three years in was four days away from bankruptcy and they got, um, they, they signed a term sheet with, uh, with a, a backer hmm. who then withdrew the term sheet a day before. Hmm. And so they actually were insolvent and he was, he was walking to the office to basically tell everybody that they, they were shut down. Yeah. And in like the, the 11th, our 59th minute was basically saved by this guy, John Malone, who is a massive media entrepreneur, founder of Liberty Media. Now, um, you know, obviously very much involved in Discovery and Warner. Um, and he believed in what they were doing. He loved the documentaries and he had seen them. He was one of those 10,000 homes, you know, and, and, and in, in the last moment, you know, he saved it. But, but even at that moment, John Hendricks was, he was really, he was, he was, feeling despair, but he still believed that this thing could work. He believed in his heart that Americans wanted high quality mm. television. And in the end, he managed to succeed. Now, I, I don't, you know, it's interesting to hear what he thinks about Discovery today, because he has a very different opinion about the channel today than the one that he built. But he did do it, and he did withstand, and, and that was just one of the more dramatic moments, but mm. withstand many, many moments of people saying no, people turning them down, and failing. Yeah. Would you say that is the, I guess, if there is a singular trait that unites entrepreneurs and, you know, because all their stories are different, all yeah. the pivots are different, all yeah. the specific business tactics are a bit different. Yeah. But the one thing that seems to be true, whether it's at the beginning, the middle, you know, even in the later stages of a company is they have to overcome rejection. Yes. Yes, 100%. And that is, I mean, as you say, every story is different. Your story is different from Topa Watana's story, who founded Calendly, is mm -hmm. different from Stuart Butterfield's story, is different from Sarah Blakely's story of Spanx, or, you know, um, 
Shanlin Ma, who founded Zola, who's our, our, our latest episode, the biggest, one of the biggest um, uh, wedding planning sites in the United States. Every story is different. What, what is similar is that every person who comes up with an idea, and I'm not talking just about founders, I'm talking mm. about people who come up with new products mm. or you know, take a risk and introduce a new way of working within a company, um, you, you, you will inevitably hear no or some resistance or somebody will say, if it's such a great idea, why, why hasn't it been done before? Mm. If it's so good, why isn't it out there? If, door, if, if this delivery service you weren't coming up with, why, why haven't yeah. other people done it? And, and that's a natural question to ask. The, the thing is that there are many people who become discouraged at that point and don't pursue it. And the people who do pursue it are the ones who end up being on the show. It's not that they're smarter. It's not that they're better educated. It's that they somehow have figured out how to withstand the rejection of the nose. It doesn't mean it's fun or pain-free, but they just march forward. Now, some of them have a natural ability to do it. If you meet Mark Cuban, that guy can hear no a million times and he has a smile on his face and he's still in a great mood and he's gonna go work at the bar at night and get tips and then go out the next day and, and try and do it all over again. Because that's how he started. He started by installing like Lotus on computers mm -hmm. for people and ended up selling his business and he made $2 million and he was 30. And then he started the next business, which became broadcast.com that he sold to Yahoo, right? But sometimes people who are not naturally inclined to, to absorb rejection, mm -hmm. they figure out how to deal with it by exposing themselves to rejection. It's like a version of exposure therapy, right? It's like, it's like um, CBT, um, you know, cognitive behavioral, behavioral um, uh, treatment, which is, you do a job that requires you to um, experience rejection. So a good example is Topa Watana of Calendly. He was a student at the University of Georgia and in the 90s, uh, actually uh, in the early 2000s, and he was a child of immigrants. He, he actually was born in Nigeria, came to the US at 15, went to the University of Georgia, and he needed to pay for college. He had no money, and he needed spending money. And he got a job as a, as a sales rep for ADT, alarm systems. Now imagine going door to door in Athens, Georgia, every day trying to sell ADT. Okay, 90% of those people are just like not even opening the door. And I asked him, I said, how did you deal with that? How did you deal with so many people not even opening the door for you or slamming the door in your face or saying not interested? And he said, because what I realized was that there was a hit rate. Eventually, I would get a yes, mm -hmm. and when I did, I made $500 in commission, and that was an, such an insane amount of money that I didn't care if I got 99 no's, because all I cared about was that one yes. But that really steeled him to create a business 12 years later after he, he had went through several different attempts to start businesses. He had a barbecue business, and a, he, he tried to import Quote, big green eggs, none of it worked. But Calendly did work, and it took a long time for people to take it seriously. He could not get a single person to invest in the business, which is in part why he owns like 75% of the company to this day. But he, he was able to persevere because he had that rejection mm -hmm. exposure early in his life, and I think it's really important. It's why a lot of you know, younger people who are interested in business, I'll say, what, how should I get started? And I say, go into sales. Mm go into sales, learn how to hear no, learn how to hear <laughs> from people who say, I'm not interested, because that actually can turn you into somebody who can deal with it when it really matters, when you're going to investors trying to raise money. Yeah, DoorDash heard at least 100 no's over the course of our journey, so I, I definitely get it, I definitely get it. Um, as, as companies start morphing maybe into more successful businesses, you know, you kind of titled this last section of the book, the destination as they maybe become more recognized yeah. as brands. What are maybe the one or two things that you, you feel like these businesses make these businesses endure? You know, they, they, they actually have <laughs> survived somehow magically um, and they become more recognized. 
but it's also so hard in business yes. to kind of be able to have this long duration. You it know, is. some of the brands that you listed um, um, have been around for decades, but some have kind of come and gone. And mm -hmm. what have you learned about those that endure? Yeah, I mean, um, we did we did WeWork on on High Built. This. I did Miguel mm. McKelvey, the mm -hmm. co-founder of WeWork, um, who's uh, and, and actually he's coming back on the show um, in a couple of weeks. You'll hear him on on How I Built This Lab, um, which is a, a second version of. We're not doing two episodes a week of How I Built This, um, and and we're bringing on former fa founders that have been on the show and bringing them back for updates. So I'll hit you up at some point to <laughs> to hear what's going on. Uh, Mark Cuban is coming has come back. You know. It's true. I mean, there are. We've even had, um, you know, uh, you know, we work. I think we work's the only example of a of a company that's not really. It's still around, but mm -hmm. of course, very, very in a very diminished um, state. Um, you know, the question is, how do you? I think many founders want to build a 100-year brand, right? right? Like you, you, you look at DoorDash and you, you want to have a 100-year brand. Right. Like people look at GE or Ford or you know Coca-Cola, these legacy companies, and they want to understand how do they, how do they. How do they, why do they exist? Why do we still buy their products? Why do we arm and hammer? You know, these products that people were using in the 20s, I mean, we're still Procter & Gamble, mm -hmm. founded during the Civil War. I mean, incredible story. But then there are other companies, Sears and Mervins and, uh, you know, I grew up in, in LA with Bullocks and, I mean, all of these department stores that don't exist anymore. You know, um, why? What's the story? And there are a variety of reasons, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, much of it comes down to management and, and decisions that were made, but you know, some of it comes down to, I think the connection that people have with mm -hmm. the product and how to maintain that connection. You know, I, I know I, I go back to food a lot, but how is it that a brand like In-N-Out Burger, which has been around since before McDonald's, mm -hmm. How is it that it doesn't matter what time you're at an In-N-Out, there's always a line? Hmm. How is that possible? They have three things in the menu, hamburger, <laughs> cheeseburger, double-double. How is that possible? There's a connection hmm. that that brand has developed with its cus customers, whether consciously or unconsciously, but, but they have a deep connection with their, with their consumers. And I think that is, you know, it's almost like a holy grail. I don't know the answer if mm -hmm. I did I think I would be a multi-billionaire because I could go around and tell people how to do it but it, it, I think that is the essential factor it's it's that connection it's that it's it's this in almost intangible thing about the product or service that you feel you need and and you want to continue to you know to, to be a part of yeah one of the things that you kind of right in this section of the book is um, is just the importance of actually two things that I don't know get talked about that much, certainly not necessarily always in business school case studies around culture and kindness. And I, I'm, I'm curious why those topics, like why do you cover those in this section of the book, especially, um, you know, when, when again, like a lot of this is about the hero's journey. And sometimes I, I don't know if culture and kindness kind of show up as the yeah. top, yeah. you know, book ends of, of the hero's journey. Yeah, and, and if I were to sort of like critique myself, I think that you could, and there's a lot of holes you can poke in, in, in my book or my show, and, and, and they're all fair. I think that this is, I mean, you know, you, there are plenty of, of, of companies out there and founders out there, very successful founders, who I think you'd be hard pressed to say they're kind, hmm. right? Um, I think we know, we can imagine some of them are, are in our minds, some incredibly successful founders of companies. But I do think that um, in general, on balance, successful companies are kind companies. Mm. That kindness is, is, is sort of integrated into the culture from day one. Mm. Um, and that it is, it is a, an article of faith and, a, and part of that contract that you have, you know, between and among the people who, who, who work with you. It's about respect. It's about listening to people. Mm -hmm. um, it's about elevating people. It's about, it's about your, the, your people, you know? It's yeah. about the people who make what you do and who believe in the mission and who are part of growing it. I, I think that, you know, again, there are all kinds of examples where, depending on how you look at it, 
um, you know, you could say, well, I don't know if it's always if 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 it's always kind or if it's always exactly what you know what what that word means. But you know, I think of 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 a company like um, you know, um, I mean, Starbucks is a, a tricky example because there are obviously there I think there are plenty of employees who would who who had different views on this, especially around, you know, unionization efforts. But I think it's really hard to, to look at somebody like Howard Schultz, who I've met, I've met a few times and not say he's kind. He, he is a very kind person and leader. And when, when a leader behaves that way mm. and um, exudes that kind of spirit, it does have a huge effect and impact on the corporate culture. It is important. And um, and not just, just not just from you know not just just morally, but it's also good business. Mm. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's actually good business. People want to work for kind companies. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I um, well, we got about twenty minutes left. I thought we conclude with you know some audience questions as well as you know we'll, we'll, at the very end. I'll make sure we'll turn it right back to where we started, which is a few more questions about you. Um, actually, one of the questions that came up from the audience, and, and please, as you have them, whether you're online, please text chat. If you're here in the room, please, you know, fill out the note cards nearby. Um, it was was actually about the beginning of of the journey and in, in, in founding a business, and 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 this uh, guest really wants to know about co-founders and co-founder relationships. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts, and I find it interesting to figure out what makes a co-founder relationship work, and what makes them fall apart. I love the co-founders who go to couples therapy, for example. Yeah. What are your observations about co-founder partnerships? Yeah, I mean, and, and I think I'd love to hear your take on this too because mm -hmm. you have a, a perspective too, Tony. Um, look, there are a couple of very simple principles, right? It's that you have strengths and, you're, and, and you find somebody who also has strengths that are not necessarily your strengths. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the traditional co-founder partnership. The reality is, and what I've seen in so many of the interviews I've done is a lot of it's just luck, you know, because you might meet somebody who you really think is awesome and you start a business together and then it starts to fall apart after about a year. And that happens a lot. Um, and then sometimes it starts to fall apart, but then you have the foresight and the wherewithal to try and work through it. Which is, which is where you go to couples therapy for co-founders. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite stories is the story of EO Products, based here in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. in San Rafael. Um, Susan Griffin Black uh, was married to uh, her co-founder. They, they, well, they started the business together, they fell in love, and they built this business. And it's a really awesome company. They make you know, beauty products and oil, essential oils and uh, soaps. And during the pandemic, they really pivoted into um, hand sanitizers um, and a really powerful natural products company. They own it. Well, they have two kids, and they also divorced. They had a divorce. Mm. And, you know, they were bickering in the office, and she talks about this uh, on the podcast. Um, and it was challenging. And they had to decide what they were going to do. Was one of them going to leave? Or gonna, were they going to shut the company down? But they were adult enough to, uh, to, to see that mm. this company still had incredible potential. It was like, this is like 15, 10, 15 years ago when EO Products was much smaller than it is today. Mm. They divorced and they continued and continue to run the company together. They all, both of them have different partners, okay? And they've grown that company, you know, X fold because they were adults, they were smart. They saw the opportunity and they saw that each of them had a skill set. It, it wasn't easy, but they figured out how to put the mission and the company ahead of their own egos and mm. their own, you know, their own whatever, their own anger, frustration, or, or you know. And it's it's hard. I, I mean, it's really. I don't know if I could do it. Right? It's really hard. But but I've seen that in in several successful companies, you know, when and there are of course examples of companies where they, it does come apart. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it has to come apart. You know, sometimes it's for the it's for the the best of the company. Um, but I, I I'm always impressed at co-founders who 
who can recognize the friction and can seek help, can find somebody to help them work it through or to at least attempt to work to work through it. I mean, you you have a co-founder, you had a co-founder and yeah, well, we, we, we had you know, a, a team of four, and we had a departure early on. And, yeah. and I think my best advice I could give on this topic is you have to work the relationships as much as you work your business. You know, I mean, you're sprinting 24-7. Everyone is stressed out. Everyone has way more on their plate than they think they can handle. And you're just trying to survive to make this you know, idea into a project, into an actual company. And I think it's so easy to spend 200% of the energy on the on the task or the business at hand and zero to negative energy or time on the relationship. And I think that's my best piece of advice on this topic is that you actually have to do work on that, calling out the elephants in the room, going to couples therapy or, you know, whatever the tactics or mechanisms may be. But keeping that to be a principal part of how you start is an important part of how you can last. Um, more questions. All right. Well, so actually, this one is really interesting where um, it, it talks a bit about, you know, some of your inspirations, this question. Um, you've obviously been inspired by your own family history and you've been um, you, you've had, you know, obviously amazing access to talking to a, a, a lot of different people. Aside from your father and your family, who has been your greatest mentor and what have you learned from them? Yeah, I mean, I've been really, really fortunate to have several really important mentors um, in my life, and 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 really, um, people I found early on in my career um, around journalism, people who I'm still in touch with, who I still regularly talk to, um, you know, people who encourage me. I think that finding mentor. I mean, for me, finding, and I think for a lot of us finding mentors is it's hard work you know it and it requires work on your part you can't just walk up to somebody and say can i be your can you be my mentor <laughs> it's usually um it's 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 usually more organic you know you take an interest in somebody else's work and you're interested in what they do and you start to kind of ask them about what they do and mm -hmm. eventually you bring some of your work to them and ask for their feedback um, and I was very fortunate to have had that in my career. And, and in fact, one of my mentors lives here in, in Berkeley, mm. and I see her um, pretty regularly. I've, I, I've had mentors at different phases in my career who have been incredible. And, now I, and to this day, I still seek out mentors who have a lot more experience in business and in management. Um, as, I, as I'm involved in, in two businesses that I founded, and and I seek them out for guidance. One of them is a former head of NPR, Jarl Mohn, and uh, just a, a terrific, brilliant, brilliant guy who just has an incredible career in media. Um, and I, you know, I, what, what I, what I love about what I do, and is, I, I when I started out interviewing people, right? Twenty, I've been in this business for twenty-five years. Right in in, in 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 radio radio now audio journalism, or audio storytelling, whatever you want to call it. And for the first sort of five to ten years of my career, I was really okay as an interviewer. I was fine. I wasn't good. Then I got a little better, and then better and better. And it's like it's like being a basketball player standing at the free throw line. Like the first ten years of your career. Or when you start playing basketball, you're just going to miss a lot of those shots. And eventually you're going to make them because you're really experienced being able to judge how far it is from that free throw line to the basket. And so now, you know, 20,000 people later, I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do. But what I love about what I do, and I, I did it this morning, I'll do it tomorrow, and I'll do it later in the week, is I get better and better every time I interview somebody. Hmm. I get better at it every time. And I feel it. I just interviewed Hamdi Olakaya of Chobani. He's not gonna, we're not going to put him on the show for another three months or so because our process is long. But I could just feel in that interview this flow, you know, that we were really digging into his life story in such a powerful way because what I'm looking for, what I'm looking for my guests, what, what, I'm, what I'm looking for them to do is not to 
burnish their reputations or to, or for me to elevate them and for people to think, oh my gosh, this person's amazing. I'm looking for them to be generous. I'm looking for them to come to that interview in a spirit of generosity because our listeners depend on it. You know, mm. our listeners are everybody from people like you to somebody who's got an Etsy store selling jewelry to some, or a Shopify store or a brick and mortar or people who don't run businesses but are working inside companies trying to think more creatively. And I need that person to come to that interview in a spirit of generosity to share and open up and, and, and be, be vulnerable. And so to get to that place, I have to, do, I have to be really, really present in my job. I have to be a really active listener. And that is a skill I've developed over 25 years. It is not a superpower. I am not more talented or smarter or better than other people. I'm just really practiced at it. And I, mm. I work really hard to get better at it. You know, when I'm, when I'm sitting with you in an interview or with Hamdi Ulakaya or Shanlin Mavzola, I am focused on you. It's like, mm. I have no social media. I have no distractions. My phone is not in the studio. It's just you and me and, 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 and COVID in my head, in my ears, headphones, right? But just the two of us. And when you can experience that kind of conversation, by the way, very few of us get to do that. It's such a privilege, right? I think some of you might remember when you were young, you had a telephone in your house and there was a long cord and you could drag it to a closet and sit there and have a conversation in the dark. And we don't get to do that anymore because we communicate through texting and social media and it's quick. So I'm very privileged. I get to talk to people and have this active mm. listening session and I get better at it every time. And so that's, you know, that to me is, is, is what I, you know, what I, and I, and, and that's a form of mentorship too. You know, mm. when I, when I, when I seek people out, I'm always, I'm looking to, to, you know, to extract their wisdom because it, it's going to make me better at what I do. That's yeah. the hope. Well, I, I, I get, you know, a few more from the audience and, and this one I, I really love. I think it's a super important question. I, I know you're, you're working on it in some of the stories you're telling, which is how can we continue to improve and accelerate the access to capital for people of color and for women? Yeah. And it's, I mean, I think that this has been, um, every year, you know, um, the, the numbers have, are, are moving ever so slightly. You know, I think, I think in the first year I was doing How I Built, there was like 2% of, of venture money was going to, 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 to women-founded businesses and, and you know, roughly that amount and less was going to businesses founded by women of color, particularly. Um, I think that what's, what's been happening in the last year and we'll still, we, you know, the, we, we, the, the jury's out. We will see if, if in fact, all of the commitments from venture, com venture firms and from family offices and, and companies that have venture arms, if those commitments will indeed come to fruition. Mm -hmm. But there has been, um, you know, very overt um, commitments by, you know, the Goldman Sachs of the world and, mm -hmm. and other large um, institutional investors to um, allocate a very significant portion of their money to, to, to women and, and founders of color. You're also seeing, um, I mean, I'm seeing sort of anecdotally um, a lot, a, a sort of a, a, I think a significant growth in the number of fund managers, both women and men of color, which is also something that has been sort of um, long overdue. You know, one of the challenges I think has been that the way money has been allocated in general is that investors are looking to obviously mitigate risk. So they're looking for people who have a long track record of investing and can show the outcomes of that track record. Well, the reality is if you don't have a track record, right. how are you going to start? How are you going to get the, the funding and the financing? And so I think what's happened, what's happened over the last year and and year and a half from from what i've seen anecdotally and even in conversations with mm -hmm. investors is that there has been um i think a sea change in in the approach to how you think about um supporting and, and financing fund managers and founders um and you know 
my hope is that that is not just a blip, but that is actually the norm. Um, I mean, this country is the most diverse racially, ethnically, religiously, culturally. It's the most diverse human experiment in history. And, um, and that's a fact, right? And, and our greatest, some of our greatest companies and ideas and businesses have been founded by immigrants, children of immigrants, mm -hmm. and, um, and that will only continue, especially as our country becomes even more racially and eth ethnically diverse over the next 10 and 20 years. So a question that I was repeated actually on, I think I can count at least three of these note cards is, who haven't you interviewed that is on the wait list, if you will, for yeah. this audience and maybe the audience that's listening online, and who's just someone that you still want to talk to? You know, the challenge is that I need you to um, come to the interview in a spirit of surrender. <laughs> so we get a thousand pitches a week. Wow. We do 45 Monday episodes and 45 shorter versions, How I Built This Lab. And every week we receive a thousand pitches, which I'm, I, I'm just stunned. I mean, when wow. I started the show seven years ago as a side project, right. was not never intended to become this kind of phenomenon. Um, and obviously we're super honored by that, but it's a big responsibility because we have a big audience of three and a half million people listening every week and they expect us to meet a certain standard. Not just the audio fidelity, but the facts. Mm. You know, every episode of How I Built This is meticulously fact-checked. I do seven to 10 hours of reading for every guest. It goes through multiple edits and fact-checks. Um, and then it gets an original score. The audio is mastered, so it sounds perfect to your ears. We really, this is all we do. We only make audio shows. And so because we put so much care into it, we need guests who are also coming to the show in that spirit. Um, so every guest that we invite on, onto the show, and we generally, we, you know, we accept pitches, but we receive so many, and we spend so much of our time looking for great stories. I have a conversation with every guest before, and I say, look, here's what to expect. There's no rules. I'm gonna ask you everything. It's very granular. Um, we can't manufacture a conversation because our audience is, is gonna, like, they're, they're going to revolt. Like they cannot, they will not accept that. This, I have to be their avatar. And so, um, you know, because sometimes we'll get pitches from publicists or companies. They'll say, well, you can't ask about this, 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 and that. And my, my response to that is, I totally get it. You're, you're doing your job to protect your client. Here's the thing. When your client is ready to talk openly and to surrender to the process and trust us, let me know because we want to have that conversation. We want to have an honest, full 360 degree conversation. So that's the first thing, was we need the guest to be willing to do that. Now, mm. there are some really interesting founders um, and, and I'm, I'm not sure they're quite ready mm. to, to do that yet. I mean, I'll give you an example of somebody I would love to interview. And, and I know I'm gonna get some, potentially some weird sort of responses. to this. Kanye West, okay, now. Hmm. Kanye West would be a very challenging person to interview because is he gonna to come to the interview on a day where um, he's feeling self-reflective or is he gonna to come to, an, mm. to the interview on a day where you know, he, str he struggles, of course. Um, and, but his story is quite remarkable. He's one of, I think, eight black billionaires in the United States and has really built an incredible business around his, around him, around who he is. Um, you know, the, the fact that he's widely considered to be the greatest, not just hip hop artist, but one of the greatest artists, like at Prince level, you know, at, at Bob Dylan level in, in American history is really significant. He's a very challenging person, very controversial. I think some of the things he's done have certainly challenged me as a listener to his music, but I, I think if we could have an open, mm. honest conversation about his life, that would be o revealing and interesting to a general audience, even people who, his story, where he came from, how he became who he became. I think there would be a lot of value to that story. So, and there are other founders um, who I would say the same thing, that, that despite their, their challenging behavior sometimes, mm -hmm. if they were willing to come on the show and talk about it in an open way, in a revealing way, um, that, then, then that's, that's what I ask for. That's what I need. 
My final question is a question that I know you've asked at least 500 times um, in your interviews, and it's, um, I think, a propos to maybe end it the way that you end a lot of your interviews, um, at least when the podcasts are aired, which is, how much of your success would you attribute to luck versus skill? <laughs> This is like the most controversial question I ask because I, I did it at the beginning from episode one with Sarah Blakely yeah. just as a kind of a throwaway thing. And then I kept doing it. And, um, and, and every now and again, I get people who write in and say, I hate that question so much. <laughs> and I hate you and I want you to die. And, um, and I feel terrible. And I, I sometimes think, well, maybe I should stop asking it. And I did, did not ask it in one or two episodes. And then people wrote and said, why didn't you ask that question? I was waiting for it. <laughs> so I'm kind of a prisoner of that question now. Um, it's not designed to, to, to literally get the answer. Like, and that's, the answer to that question isn't what matters. Mm -hmm. The question is asked after a three to four hour conversation with somebody. Now, if you remember that modern love column in the New York Times where the writer talked about this questionnaire that can make you fall in love with somebody, do you remember that? Okay, and, and she did end up falling in love with the, the person she did it with. If I have a three to four hour interview with somebody, at the end of that conversation, it doesn't matter who it is, who it's with, we've developed a connection because I know so much about your life and I have found out much more about your life in the course of the conversation, and you have too, because I've asked you questions that trigger memories mm. from your life. So you've also now spent four hours reflecting on your life. When do we ever do that? We're, mm. we, we're not all Socrates. We don't reflect on our lives all the time. So there's something that happens. There is a connection, right? And I ask that question really as a vehicle or as a... Um, yeah, as a vehicle to allow the person to reflect on the last four hours. We've just talked now. Think about everything you've, now you've seen your own movie. We've been in the cockpit of your head. We've been in your consciousness and we've driven through your life story. Like, like, like you know, um, like that's, that, that, that show, that science show, um, when I was a kid, I can't remember the name, the magic um, School bus, it's like the magic school bus, okay? We've been the magic school bus and you're through, through, through DoorDash, whatever your story is. Now, you've been there with me. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? Like you started out there and you're here. What do you think? How do you think that happened? Are, and, and it's really just a chance for them to say, it is pretty crazy, you know? Like, and I worked really hard. Whatever they say, I worked really hard or I got lucky. In my case, I, I, put a lot of, I, I put a lot of stock in luck, and I'll tell you why. Because in August of 2000, I went, it was a month before I was sent to Berlin to be the NPR correspondent in Eastern Europe, and I was terrified. I was not qualified. I was not ready for that. I, I was a total imposter. I was like, mm -hmm. I, I fooled everybody. I pulled the wool <laughs> over their eyes and convinced them that I could do this job. And I was terrified. I was really scared because I, I was like, what are they doing sending me there? I, I'm a child. August of 2000, I went to a barbecue in Washington, D.C. a month before I left. And I saw somebody there who I talked to. I, had the cur I mustered up the courage to talk to. And she's my wife today. Now, if I didn't go to that barbecue and she didn't go, I would never have met her. It was a month before I left to Europe for seven years. Mm. We met there and that was luck because without that person in my life, I wouldn't be doing what I do today. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be this person. I wouldn't have the confidence or the courage to do what I did. And so I've mm. got to give a lot of credit to luck. With that, let's celebrate Guy Raz. Thank you. All right, well, I think Guy's going to be here, actually, for some book signings, and so it's a great opportunity if you have yours or if you want to get a copy. I know we'll, we're going to be setting it all up in the lobby, and uh, have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs>